This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and, and planets that you'll see overhead during February. We'll track down one, two, three, four, five planets in the evening sky, explore the moon's phases, take stock of winter's brightest stars, and track down two lesser-known constellations. That's a full plate, so bundle up, grab your curiosity, and come along on this month's Sky Tour. Last month, I mentioned how Earth is actually its closest to the sun during early January. I know, I know, the cold weather here in the Northern Hemisphere is telling a very different story. But, because we're closer to the sun right now, Earth is moving along its orbit at a faster clip too. And that means we Northerners are rapidly moving away from the depths of winter, at least astronomically speaking. In fact, February 4th marks the midway point between December's solstice and the March equinox. So daytimes are getting longer and nights shorter. Did you know that you can tell the season just by looking at the moon? It's true. You've probably noticed that the sun stays pretty low in the sky even at midday during winter, but that it gets very high up during summer. But for the moon, it's just the opposite. The full moon climbs highest in the sky during winter sky during winter months. Here's what I mean. February starts out with the first quarter moon on the 5th, followed by the big, fat, full snow moon on the 12th. In between, on the 8th, those of us at mid-northern latitudes will find the waxing gibbous lunar disk almost directly overhead in late evening. Lalo's on the 20th and new moon on the night of the 27th. Last month, I also talked about the supposed grand alignment of six planets, apparently on January 25th to be specific. Social media was on fire with this nonsense. A post about it on Sky and Telescope's website got a half, a half million views. Apparently someone, somewhere, realized that four bright planets, Venus and Saturn in the west, Jupiter high overhead, and Mars in the east, were forming some rare, wonderful lineup in the sky. Even more special, they were joined by Uranus and Neptune, neither of which can be seen by eye. Well, guess what? The planets always move along the same path in the sky, as do the Sun and also the Moon, more or less. This line is called the ecliptic, and it's basically tracing out the plane of the planet's orbits across the sky. What I don't get is that there was never anything special about January 25th, 25th. That was complete fiction. But what is true, then and now, is that these four bright planets will remain in view for most of February. Start by looking for crazy bright Venus well up in the west soon after sunset. Much fainter Saturn is lurking below it, and as the days go by, it slips ellipse ever closer to the western horizon during twilight. Toward the end of February, you'll be challenged to spot Saturn by eye. And yet, by then it will have some company, as Mercury starts to climb toward its best evening showing of the year. In fact, on the evening of February 24th, Saturn and Mercury will side and less than two degrees apart. But they'll be just barely above the horizon in strong twilight. Get those binoculars ready. Meanwhile, the thin crescent moon moves through this area of the sky early in the month. A special treat awaits you after sunset on February 1st, when the three-day-old crescent moon joins dramatic pairing shouldn't be missed. And if you do miss it, don't worry. It'll repeat again on the evening of March 1st. And as the sky darkens, keep an eye on the moon for a faint, ghostly glow filling in the shadowed part of its disk. This is called Earthshine. It's the ricochet of sunlight that first Earthshine. It's the ricochet of sunlight that first reflects off our planet and then onto the moon's night hemisphere, lighting up the lunar landscape brightly enough that we can see it back here on Earth. Another way to think of it is to imagine that you're standing on the moon. From here, we see the sunlit part of the moon as just, just a thin crescent. But from your lunar landing site, Earth would appear almost full. Now, Earth is about four times the moon's diameter, and all our clouds and snow make us more reflective overall. So a full Earth, as seen from the moon, is a hundred times brighter than the full moons we see from here. Wow! 
That's a floodlight shining onto the lunar night. Okay, back to our planet parade. As darkness falls, look straight up, not quite to overhead, to spot brilliant Jupiter. It's roughly a tenth as bright as Venus, but it's still striking. And well up in the east, separated from Jupiter by about three or four times the width of your Mars. These nights you can really tell that the red planet is, well, red. It's no competition for Venus and Jupiter, but it's still quite bright and easy to spot. Enjoy this planet parade while you can. It's an easy way to introduce your friends and family to the night sky. And for you six planet family to the night sky. And for you six planet fans, well, Uranus and Neptune are up there as well, but completely invisible to your eyes. Uranus is about two fists to the west of Jupiter, and Neptune is lurking very low in the west, below Venus. Now, for most of us across North America, Europe, and most of Asia, February nights are too cold to comfortably spend much time outdoors. So, this month, let's try a stargazing activity that I promise you can finish in five minutes or less. Ready? Let's go. Some clear evening in February, go outside after it's gotten reasonably dark, around 7 p.m. Then out with a wide view all around, and face west, more or less the direction where the sun set. Give your eyes a couple of minutes to adjust to the darkness, and then make a mental snapshot of what you see. Apart from Venus, you're not seeing many obvious stars, are you? Well, to the right of Venus, you can probably pick out the great diamond of four medium bright stars over the western horizon. It's a little larger than the size of your clenched fist. But nothing really commands your attention, right? Now, make a generous turn toward the left and look up. What a difference! Even if you have a lot of light pollution, you'll see Jupiter, Mars, and a bunch of bright light pollution. You'll see Jupiter, Mars, and a bunch of bright stars. And why is that? Well, it's not obvious, but in that direction, you're looking outward along the plane of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. And it happens that many bright stars are relatively close by on that side of the Milky Way's disk. The most lowest of the lot down in the southeast is Sirius. It's actually the brightest star in the entire nighttime sky and only eight and a half light years from Earth. In other words, the gleam of light that you're seeing now left the star in late 2016. Let's work our way upward from Sirius to its upper right -er arguably the brightest and most striking constellation in the northern sky. Orion is easily distinguished even through light pollution because of the row of three medium-bright stars that form his belt. To the belt's upper left is the bright red supergiant star Betelgeuse, and to its lower right is icy white Rigel. These two stars mark his shoulder and raised foot, respectively. Now can you notice a slight difference in color between them? Betelgeuse has a warm hue, and much hotter Rigel shines blue-white. Okay, my five minutes are up. Are you game to stay out a little longer? Give me, just another, give me just another few minutes, okay? Being a hunter, Orion needs hunting dogs. Brilliant Sirius is the anchor star in Canis Major, the big dog. In fact, Sirius is often called the dog star. Higher up, directly to Orion's left, is Procyon in Canis Minus Minor, the little dog. These two constellations faithfully follow the hunter across the sky throughout the night, ready to snatch up his prey. Let's broaden out the view. Follow Orion's belt to the upper right, and you'll see a bright, slightly reddish star called Aldebaran, marking the angry eye of Taurus, the bull, half fist below Jupiter. Classified as an orange giant star, Aldebaran is more than 40 times the sun's diameter, and it's relatively close by, 65 light years away. In other words, the light you're seeing now left Aldebaran in 1960. That year, John F. Kennedy beat Richard Nixon and, be and became, at 43, the youngest person ever elected U.S. President. Aldebaran is on the left edge of a loose cluster of stars called the Hyades. But Aldebaran isn't part of this cluster. It's just closer to us along the same line of sight. Now let your eyes drift a little more than one fist to Aldebaran's upper, right, Aldebaran's upper right, and look for a small cluster of stars called the Pleiades, or sometimes the Seven Sisters. The first quarter moon will be very close by on the evening of February 5th, and actually it will cover parts of the cluster for those of you in western North America. 
Look carefully at the cluster and you might see six or seven Pleiades, as they're called, but there are actually hundreds of stars here. They all formed together about a hundred million years ago, when dinosaurs were in their prime. The entire cluster is about twice the size of the full moon, and it looks terrific through binoculars or a small telescope. The Pleiades were actually a deal some years ago because astronomers couldn't agree on how far away they are, but now the debate is over. The true distance, about 450 light years. Now turn your gaze farther upward, directly overhead. There you'll find bright Capella, anchor star in the constellation Auriga, a charioteer who may let your gaze settle back down toward the eastern horizon, and to the left of Mars you'll pass the twins of Gemini, the star Castor, and slightly brighter Pollux. All the stars mentioned so far are landmarks in the late autumn and winter sky. I don't want to overstay my welcome, but if you can hang I don't want to overstay my welcome, but if you can hang with me for just a few more minutes, we can go on a kind of treasure hunt for two lesser known constellations. You should do this in the last half of February when the moon isn't up and the sky is as dark as possible. Find a place that doesn't have many strong lights nearby and that will Our first target is a celestial rabbit named Lapis. Our little hare is hiding in plain sight right underneath Orion and just to the right of Sirius. If your sky is good and dark, you can make out a pair of ears sticking up toward Rigel and the hare's body and tail bend toward upper left. Now, Betelgeuse, Sirius, and Procyon form a beautiful equilateral triangle in the sky known to stargazers as the Winter Triangle. There's nothing much inside that triangle as bright stars go, but this is the realm of the constellation Monoceros. Can you guess what it represents? You probably know that mono means one or single, and seros derives from the ancient Greek word for horn. Now, what has just one horn? Hmm, well, it could be a rhino, but that's not very mythical. Aha! Monoceros is the celestial unicorn. This dimly drawn beast is unicorn. This dimly drawn beast is facing Orion. Think of Procyon and the little dog as riding on its back. Now that you've been outside for a while, I've got one final question for you. How many stars can you see? Well, on a moonless night, far from any light pollution, your eyes can pick out a couple of thousand stars. So really my question is, how faint are the faintest stars that you can see? This isn't a random question. Here's your chance to contribute to a worldwide database of sky darkness measurements made by everyday folks like you and me. This is important work, and yet it's very easy to participate. This month, the target area is Orion. Easy, right? No experience or equipment is needed. All you need are your eyes, a moonless night, and a willingness to help. So please, please go to the website globeatnight.org to find out what you need to do. On the stars and planets for another month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this sky tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating or a review. It'll help spread the word about Sky Tour. And as always, I welcome your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and is produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, we'll explore why Sirius is as famous in summer as it is in winter. Until then, I wish you clear skies.